Greetings. I realized I haven't done a vintage pen in uh, quite a while, so I'm doing a vintage pen today, and I figured if I'm doing a vintage pen, we'll go really far back. Um, this pen is a Waterman Model 52. This pen is uh, probably not quite 100 years old. It's probably from maybe the early 1920s, but let's say it's 100 years old, give or take a few years. So in any, any case, it's a very, very old pen. This pen was made by the Waterman Pen Company, which was a New York pen company founded in 1884. It then eventually evolved into the current French Waterman Company, um, which has been predominantly a French company for, I think, about the last 50 or 60 years. The French Waterman Company is now actually owned by an American conglomerate, so it one can maybe make the case that it's an American company again, but um, it's basically been Waterman's basically been um, a, uh, you know considered a French pen company for for quite a while. Um, this is a uh, pen that is made out of what is called black chased hard rubber. Um, when you in the vintage pen collecting world, you see the initials B C. HR a lot, standing for black chased hard rubber. So what that means is the hard rubber part is obvious. It is made out of hard rubber. The chasing might be not obvious to many people. The term chasing means this um, pattern that is um, uh, etched or you know um, inscribed into the into the hard rubber. Um, many pens that this old have sort of lost their chasing over the years because. You know, from wear and tear and being polished, etc., the chasing is, is not a particularly deep etching into the pen. So this one has retained um, a very large amount of its chasing, which is which is a nice, nice feature. Um, it is a very light pen because the, the hard rubber is not a heavy material. It only weighs 14 grams. It is not a particularly large pen either. It is somewhat average. Here it is compared to a Lamy Safari and a Pilot Metropolitan. So it is pretty much right in line with a average size modern pen uh, of our current era. Um, the numbering system on these pens uh, implied the size of the pen. So the second digit and the number, so what Waterman always did was, Waterman pens of this era almost invariably have the model number stamped on the end of the pen, as this one does here, the 52. The two implies the nib size. So if we open it up, this would be considered a number two sized Waterman nib. And if we look at the nib, you will see at the very bottom, it says, it says Waterman Ideal New York and a number two. Just to give that in way of comparison, I have another Waterman pen from around the same era. This is a model 55 and this is a number five sized Waterman nib. So that's the difference between a number two size Waterman nib of the era, that era and a number five sized Waterman nib of that era. Um, it's got a very nice nib. This is a gold nib with a heart-shaped breather hole. Has a fairly decent amount of flex, as we will see in the writing sample. Um, and it is, I'm a huge fan of these old vintage gold nibs. There's a certain feel and flexiness and springiness to them that modern nibs have a very, very hard time um, uh, uh, emulating. Um, it's a screw-off cap that takes one and a fraction turns to unscrew. It does post, it posts very nicely, um, and you get a nice long pen, and again, because it's a light pen, it's very easy to use Post it. It has the original clip. It says on it, clip cap uh, with a patent number and a patent date of September 28th, 1905, and the little Ideal logo, which was Waterman's brand. These caps very often in many vintage pens have come off over the years. Um, it was sort of a little bit of a weak point on the pen. So very often what you will see with a pen of this era, and I'll show you this on my Waterman 55, is you'll see either no clip at all or the presence of what is called an accommodation clip. This is a aftermarket clip um, that would go on when the original clip, either on a pen that was originally clipless or 
uh, more than likely than not, a clip, a pen such as this one, where pen such as this one, where the clip came off and then it was replaced. Now, the interesting thing about this accommodation clip, this is a ideal branded accommodation clip that is roughly from the same era as the pen, which makes it kind of nice. But this pen, Model 55, would have originally had a clip very similar to the one that was on the Model 52, except it, it at some point in its history, it lost its clip. Um, it has very nice engraving on it. It says patented 1884, May 23rd, 1899. These are the patent dates. Waterman Ideal Fountain Pen, New York. And then it has another patent date of August 4th, 1903. So one thing we do know is that this pen is no older than 1903, but it is probably more than likely from uh, the early 1920s, if I had to guess, but it is not really something um, I could do for sure. It is a um, it is a lever filler, and it has the lever filler the lever box here, and the end of the lever has the little round Waterman Ideal Globe logo as well. So it's got the logo uh, kind of in in three places at least on the body of the pen on the cap. And on the um, lever, which is which is quite quite nice. And like I said, though it has the 52 on the end, like Waterman pens of the era does, and it's got a nice shiny, smooth top of the cap. So this is a lever filling pen. So let's ink it up and see how it writes. I'm going to ink it up with uh, Waterman Intense Black. Now, yes. Uh, Waterman ink and Waterman pen is a nice thing, but more importantly, this is a very, very safe ink for a sack filled pen. So I've said on videos before, there are only certain inks that I trust to put in vintage sack filled pens or in piston pens that are hard to clean, etc. And Waterman is definitely one of those brands. It is not the mo black as black by any means. Um, it's a pretty good, nice black, but it's definitely not the black as black by any means. But uh, it does, it is a nice, safe, safe black ink. Um, so let's uh, just ink this up. We'll set that cap aside. Um, open up the bottle and um, we'll flip the lever, which is com effectively compressing the sack when we do that. We're going to immerse it in the ink and what I like to do is do about um, two or three um, fills just to make sure the sack gets completely full and on the last one I like to just leave it in for a few seconds because what's happening on a, on a lever filler is every time you pull the lever down it's compressing the sack when you release the lever you're allowing the sack to return to its normal shape and and uh, draw up the ink so it could take a few seconds just to let the ink draw in so that is more than enough time at this point um, and uh, we'll just put that down there close up the ink um, we'll wipe this off and then we will do some writing okay folks what we are writing with here is a waterman number 52 and this is a um a um a uh, vintage pen from uh, approximately let's say 1920 give or take um now notice right off the bat with applying no pressure and just normal writing there is a fairly decent amount of line variation. And this is essentially what you want to see on a pen that with a nib that has some flex to it. So you want to be able to just sort of naturally write, not applying any pressure. And I am not applying pressure here at all. This is just the natural motion of my handwriting. And you can see variation. Look at the difference between, say, there and there. It is quite, quite significant just off the bat without even trying. If you try to actually do some flex, that's where you can really shine with a pen like this. And that's just, 
not even particularly trying to stretch it. You can actually push this nib quite a bit and get, see now it's starting to wear around, but you can actually push it quite a bit. So let's look at the difference between these two lines and it's quite significant there. And uh, I'm far from an expert on doing uh, calligraphy with these pens and pacing the drawing, etc. Um, but as you can imagine, this is, the, the, and the overall feel of this is just really something that I, I be honest I, there are very very few modern pens that can match this it does have feedback it is not scratchy by any means but there is feedback but it is and and i don't like to you throw this term around it is a beautiful feeling feedback it just absolutely feels fantastic the actual feel and the nib on the paper is just absolutely just transcendent it is really just fantastic so i cannot overemphasize how great these vintage gold nibs were and let's be clear this was a consumer grade pen this was something you could go into a stationery store in 19 in the 1920s and just walk in and buy and yes you may have only have had one pen those days it wasn't something part of it meant to be a collector's piece or anything like that but this was not something that um, uh, would be sort of considered a particularly high-end luxury item this was a functional working pen for people just to do everyday writing with this is um, a mass market consumer grade um, item uh, at the time um, so I think um, that's about all we have to say about this Waterman 52. This is a very popular pen, by the way. They sold an awful lot of these. If you look at the vintage pen market or go to pen shows, etc., you see an awful lot of these Waterman 52s. This is sort of a, um, uh, a very standard vintage pen. Um, and I might even say that if you're, if you're looking to get into a vintage pen, if you're somebody who is a fountain pen fan, and you really have not don't have vintage pens you don't have much experience in vintage pens etc i would say find a reputable online vendor or even better go to a pen show and pick yourself up one of these 52s they're not hard to find um and um, they just write phenomenally phenomenally well so this if you're sort of like i said looking to get into a vintage pen this is not a bad place to start at all it's got a very simple filling mechanism you're not dealing with a complicated filling mechanism it's etc and so forth so um uh, there you go one thing i will say about this filling mechanism and sack filled pens in general they don't hold a ton of ink but you have to understand that these pens were made in an era where everybody had a bottle of ink just sitting on their desk and everywhere you went if you walked around your office every desk had a bottle of ink sitting on it. So if the pen ran out of ink while you're in the middle of writing something, you're never within, outside of arm's reach from a bottle of ink to fill it with. So, you know, the, the capacity wasn't a major, major issue with pens in those days. When they moved from eyedropper pens to sack fillers, they're obviously sacrificing a fair amount of ink capacity. Obviously, both those were far superior to a dip pen, which is really what effectively they're they're competing with um but um uh you just you know you this, these pens are from an era where people did a lot of writing but that bottle of ink was never out of reach so the capacity was just not a massive massive issue for a modern use perspective i've never really had a problem getting sort of a day's worth of writing out of this pen so i would typically fill the pen up and it'll be my pen for the day and i've never ever had it run out of ink on me um uh but obviously depending on how much writing you do etc you know, and how much you're flexing it obviously if you do mostly writing like this versus writing like this obviously the ink utilization is going to be quite uh, quite different but be that as it may um i wouldn't be overly concerned about the ink capacity on uh, a sack filled pen like this okay that's enough about the pen. Let's just talk about the ink very briefly. So this is about as basic an ink as you can get. It's Waterman's. Intense black.
And this is Waterman's Standard Black Ink. It is literally um, just a basic black ink that is, like I said, I would have no problem using this ink in any pen that I own. Um, so, like I said, a sack filled pen like this or any other sack filled pen for that matter, and it, or hard to clean piston pen, an expensive pen um, that is a piston filler that cannot be disassembled, um, this is a great uh, ink for that. It is a very, very nice black. It is not the darkest black by any means, but it lays down a nice line. It looks good. It's relatively well behaved um, in terms of um, dry time, etc. It does not bleed through the paper. Um, so it is a good safe ink. But like I said, if you're investing in a vintage pen or an expensive pen, let's say you go for some like limited edition Mont Blanc that's a piston filler, piston filler etc. Um, you need to have an ink like this, a Waterman, a Mont Blanc, etc because those are essentially the the very very safest of inks that are currently made today so i think the number one word on this ink is safe um and you're not going to have to worry too much about um this melting your sack etc which i have seen with other inks do not do not if you have a sack filled pen like this or any other one put say an Orochizuku ink in it or a colorverse ink or anything like that you just the chemistry on those is just a little too wacky for um for a pen like this um keep it keep it to a waterman or mont blanc and frankly to be historically accurate keep it to a blue a black or a blue black or maybe a red for the most part crazy they didn't have crazy colored inks 100 years ago they wrote with black or blue or blue black for the 99% of the time. So stick with that to make it sort of a historically accurate uh, ink. Anyway, I think that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video and this walk back in time. As always, if you're a subscriber, I thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber, I would urge you to become one. Please keep those comments coming and those thumbs up as well. And as always, until next time, bye-bye.